pleasure to uh, welcome David Chipperfield and Anthony Gormley to the AA. Uh, neither of them are uh, strangers to the school. David, as you probably know, uh, is a graduate of the AA, and Anthony Gormley has uh, uh, been very much involved with the school on reviews, and the last time I think was being part of the first year reviews here in the school, so it's great to have them back to the school. Um, as you probably know, the, the, the initial sort of motivation for having this, uh, this uh, talk tonight entitled Collaboration is because of the fact that uh, David Chipperfield and Anthony Gormley have been working together uh, on a studio for, for Anthony Gormley that David Chipperfield has designed. And so this, I think, is, is in a sense the kind of seed for, uh, for the discussion, the presentations, and the conversation uh, that will hopefully follow um, uh, later on, uh, involving all of us. Um, Anthony Gormley's work, as you, as you uh, know, has uh, been very much uh, involved, fascinated uh, with the body, uh, the individual body, and, and uh, then uh, later on, He's been dealing with a much more uh, expanded range of, of, of bodies and, uh, and objects that, uh, that construct uh, a whole series of, uh, of different fields. But I think his, his uh, involvement with the, with the human figure, to quote him, I think, if, I, if I'm quoting correctly, somewhere he says that I'm interested in the body because it's the, it's the place where emotions are most directly registered. And he speaks very much about this notion of the body as, a, as an element of registration. When you feel frightened, when you feel excited, happy, depressed, somehow the body registers it. And I think uh, it is the, the, it's, it's amazing to see throughout the different, uh, different projects that he has worked and the placement of the, of, uh, of the bodies, how they become uh, really animated in terms of the various uh, qualities and, and conditions that they, uh, they enact. Um, some of the uh, projects that uh, I'm sure you know about, the installations are allotment, critical mass, another place, and most recently, domain field and inside Australia. Anthony Gormley's work has been exhibited extensively with solo shows throughout the UK in venues such as the Whitechapel, Tate, and Hayward Galleries, the British Museum, White Cube, and internationally at museums including the Louisiana Museum, the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, DC and the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin, um, and the uh, Cornische Kunstverein in, in, uh, in Germany. He has participated in major group shows such as the Venice Biennale and the Kassel Documenta 8. His field has toured America and Europe and will tour Asia, starting in China, uh, uh, which I think it happened uh, last year. Angel of the North uh, and most recently Quantum Cloud on the Thames in Greenwich are amongst the most celebrated examples of contemporary British, British sculpture. He was also awarded the Turner Prize in 1994, the South Bank Prize for Visual Art in 1999, and made an OBE in 1997. Uh, David Chipperfield, as I, as I mentioned, graduated from the AA. He did that in 1978, and worked in uh, a number of practices, including Douglas Stevenson Partners, Richard Rogers, Norman Foster, before establishing his own practice in 1984. I think the contribution of, uh, of uh, David Chipperfield uh, to uh, contemporary British uh, architecture has been really uh, enormous because he has been uh, one of the people who has, who has brought uh, very specific uh, discussions in, in architectural theory, in, in architectural criticism uh, through his work and made that present. So uh, I think that that's something that's, that's really um, unusual for, uh, for a lot of practices uh, in the UK and probably part of the reason for his enormous success uh, all over the world with uh, such projects as the, the Ansaldo City of Cultures, uh, the BBC Scotland Pacific Key, Glasgow City of Justice Barcelona, the Art Museum in Davenport, uh, the newest uh, museums in Berlin, uh, the Palace of Justice in Salerno, and the extension of the San Michele Cemetery Island in Venice that uh, he is uh, working on. But because we're also uh, discussing the, uh, the studio, I think one of the wonderful projects, which I hope he will show, is, uh, is also the house that uh, he has done uh, for, for uh, 
himself and his family in Galicia, which is really in this tradition of the smaller projects versus against all the much larger projects that, uh, that he has been working on over the last few years. Uh, David Chipperford has won over 20 national and international competitions and many international award citations for design excellence from the RIBA, RF, RFAC, and the AIA awards. The un he won also the, Andre the Andrea Palladio Prize and in 1999 was awarded the Tessanao Gold Medal. So uh, without any further delay, I'd like to ask Anthony Gormley to begin. Uh, he will be followed by David Chipperfield and then they will do a double act together and then it will be open to us. So please welcome Anthony Gormley. Thank you, thank you, Mason. Can, can you all hear? Am I speaking clearly? Um, well, it's really a pleasure to be here. I have to say there are only two subjects. One is, um, one is the body and the other is space. And uh, you deal with one and I deal with the other and sometimes I get the two quite badly muddled up. Um, I just thought that I should start by showing you a few slides my work because probably you're not that familiar with it um, and perhaps in the process of doing that um, express why um, it's it's wonderful I've been in this studio for, for for six months and for the first time I'm occupying in a way a, a absolutely purpose-built building that is made uh, for creative work it's in the manner of a factory but it's made for imaginative work. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a great pleasure um, making that work with, with David, and it's an even greater pleasure to now occupy it. But anyway, maybe we can just start and, and show a few slides. Oh, I have it. It's all up to me. Good. Good. So, <coughs> I like to start with this, this image. This is taken in Seoul, but it's, it's, it's kind of, this is the world we live in. Um, where, does our, where does our fit in it? These are the kind of structures that interest me, that in a way are both, are both objects and places. This is Silbury Hill. Here are other places that have become objects. This is the uh, North Atlantic Wall uh, built. Is that in focus, by the way? Have I got a focus control here? I have, haven't I? Um, this is on the west coast of Uland, Jutland, um, where really from 1940 through to the end of the war, um, many battalions of German soldiers and local collaborators built a incredible number of uh, cast concrete structures that were in the dunes and since then have been washed out. And there's something that I find absolutely fascinating about these, in a way, buildings that have since become objects. They're almost like fossils that have been washed out of the landscape and are now jumbled masses on this liminal edge between the land and the sea. This is another, in a way, sculptural form. I, I, I can't remember where I put it. I think it's probably Eastbourne. Um, I think there are so many forms in coastal architecture that occupy exactly that space that I'm interested in a space between that is both iconic uh, and utilitarian. So where does art fit in, in this world today? This is, this is the London Art Fair of about 12 years ago. Um, that's my work more or less in the middle of the slide. Art doesn't necessarily have a place anymore. It's a mobile object for exchange. Uh, this is my 
by a little protest in a way. We, uh, we ripped up the carpet. Um, there aren't many objects for sale. It's a single body form uh, place in a way in this context. I think asking that same question about where art sits and whether it has a place. This is the installation of critical mass uh, at the Royal Academy in 98, which uses that rather um, extraordinary neoclassical architecture of Burlington House to, again, uh, in a way, use the measure of the body to question the function of the building. If you remember, the facade of Burlington House has, I think, 10 uh, niched and one and a half lifetime sculptures of great artists and architects. I have made body forms like the slide uh, of learning to be in the art fair that in some way are iconic and singular. This was my last show at White Cube which is called Drawn. And that's a very large piece of dust on the left hand side. Um, but in this case, I, I made eight identical body forms that were pushed to the corners of the room. And the idea was very simply to activate the space so that the normal, in a way, authority of the orthogonal was somehow questioned so that uh, the the room potentially goes into free fall, into spin. And that the viewer coming into the space becomes less certain or maybe more conscious of gravity and his or her own position in the room itself. This is an, another way, in a way, of testing context called close. And I think of it as, in a way, indicating the place of the body on the face of the planet, mediating between centrifuge and gravity. It's in a, in a, in a way trying to cut through context to give you a sense, again, of your own body, your own experience of time and space. And I think that this is very, very important to me that these, these works of mine are, in a way, orientation instruments. They are not representations in the traditional way that the body has been figured in sculpture. This is a box. This is an empty lead case that actually encloses a mould that once enclosed my body. It comes from a, a real a real event, a real lived moment that happened in real time. And in some senses it's now aspiring to the condition of architecture. It aspires to be inhabited, but to be inhabited imaginatively. And to be used as an instrument by the viewer in some way to readjust his or her own uh, position or conception of their position in the world. And I think this is very important. Maybe we can come back to it later. Testing the world view, which I think does a similar job in a different way. At this point, my work, rather than being uh, literally the indication of the space, now makes the place of the body a mass. So there was a shift that happened around this time, about 1993, between making body cases and making body forms. Uh, these are five identical, you can't see all of them, five identical body casts, all uh, in a way taking that architectural measuring stick, the, 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 the right angle, the set square. Sometimes I've used the, the actual form of architecture, and this, this relates very much to that, uh, that side of 
of the North Atlantic wall. This is called room. It's the minimum space necessary for a body to find shelter. It was built around my dimensions. This is placed in the center of Australia. It's called a room for the great Australian desert. Um, again, this is using, in a way, the language of the second body, the language of architecture. If the body inhabits architecture, in a way, you know, if, 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 if life inhabits the body and the body inhabits architecture, maybe what I'm trying to do is use that second body to describe the first. And I think of this, well, we never published where the, where the piece was. Nobody knows the coordinates. Uh, I, I don't think it's been seen since it's been put there. But <coughs> for me, in a way, that reinforces the idea that this is, this is, this is a structure made for the imagination. It has a relationship. My, my requirements for the site were that it should have a 360-degree flat horizon around it. That piece then went on to be developed into this internalized architecture. This is a virtual city of 300 rooms. Uh, it's called Allotment. It has two avenues, four cross streets, uh, and each block has about 20 uh, rooms in it that themselves form a variety of fairly conventional uh, urban uh, structures, whether those are piazzas or squares uh, or blocks. It, it turns the internal state of a museum room into a kind of labyrinth. If that was the internalization of, a, of, of architecture, this is the internalization of landscape. This is, this is field that you may be more familiar with. Uh, this is the very first field. This is uh, about 30 tons of clay formed uh, into body surrogates that are hand-sized, that stand up, that each have two eyes, um, but made collaboratively, made uh, with 60 people helping. They completely occupy the space. So it's a, it's a, it's a form of resistance. You, you, you can't get in to the gallery because the gallery is entirely filled with the work. So that real space, in some way, becomes imaginative space. You stand as if at the shoreline of an ocean of gazes. And this is the reverse. This is a work called Another Place. Originally, I was invited to place the European field in the old Papa Course in Cuxhaven, the place of emigration where many European Jews left forever um, between the Weimar Republic and the rise of National Socialism. I didn't think that was a very good idea. The halls themselves were so potent. And after a number of visits, in the end, I made this work. It's a hundred body forms in 17 different positions of uh, inhaling and exhaling that face the horizon. They are one kilometer deep and three kilometers wide. Uh, so uh, on average, are, are around 700 meters apart. And the extraordinary thing is the tide plane in this, in this environment where the tide comes in over, over seven kilometers. Uh, so it's a very, very deep <coughs> tide plane. And the invitation is, when the, when the tide is out, to go and walk amongst the work. And then as the tide comes in, so in a way, that liminal space is taken over again by, by, by these imaginative entrants. It's, it's, it's not, even though it looks like it, uh, a reprise of Casper David Friedrich. This is a working, a working river. The Elba, there's about 500 ships a day go up the Elba. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real industrial river. <coughs> I just wanted to, uh, this is 
more or less the end of my presentation. I just wanted to talk a bit about galleries and how we might use them. This is, a, this is a, an installation at the Cologne Kunstverein called Total Strangers, which again questions the nature of a museum and how it fits in the world and the body of, uses in some way the body of the museum. Uh, six identical body forms. The, the, the museum was more or less voided, removed all the, all, all the internal walls. These works are relatively blank. They, they, they're certainly not re representational in a traditional way. Uh, this, is, this is, as it were, the void, the other side of the ledge. Um, but as you came into the space, you were aware that in some way you were being the subject in the same way that, that you were perhaps in the field of the implicit gaze or the implicit act of witnessing of the work. And there was this work placed very close to the window. Uh, there were um, four very large picture windows that are on street level. <coughs> and very quickly you realize that in some way uh, there were these decoys out in the real world and you were invited to use the, the museum in some way as a hide from which you looked at, the, at in a way, the real world and life uh, everyday life as a picture of itself interacting with these still silent body forms. So there were two immediately outside the, uh, the museum, one lying on its back. A little old lady came one morning and, and was beating at the door of the director's office, saying, uh, Director, Director, you must come quickly. One of the sculptures has fallen over. Uh, and the, the, I mean, this was just a way, I think. It was an important way of reinforcing the inertia <laughs> of the work that was obviously is much more, um, in a way, pushed in critical mass. Just the last few slides, just, just <coughs> first exercises. This is a very, very early work from 1980 called Room, which is simply, this is the very first room like, before I went on to make the concrete rooms. And this is simply an enclosure, 20 foot square, made by shredding my, my clothes, cutting them into a six millimeter strip, like I'm peeling an orange, but then leaving the clothes in exactly the same relationship as they are with each other, those shirt, uh, covered by pullover, um, trousers, underpants, and finishing at the same height where clothes stop, and making this sort of boxing ring. The pieces on the floor are layers of uh, shoe leather, one for feet. This is, a, this is, in a way, another way of activating the, the body of the museum as an object in the world. This is called Paw. It's on the side of the Winnipeg Museum of Contemporary Art in, in Canada. Uh, a lead body form on a huge blind wall. And here we finish with learning to think, which I hope you'll help us do as the, as the evening progresses. Is this working? Do I need your? It's on. Okay. I just need to change the work for the slides. Um, I, I will talk about um, what's been described as our collaboration, but in, in a way, um, you know. He was the client, and I was the architect, and um, he knew exactly what he wanted, and I sort of did what I was told, um, which is 
normally um, how we operate. Uh, but most people are not so clear about what they want or the reasons why they want it. Um, I think that uh, I, I've tried to identify a number of, of um, thoughts and, and themes in the work that might uh, help uh, lead to explain the project. Can I have the first slide? I mean, are they ready? Have you got them in? Yeah, okay. oh, I've got to do it. Forward. No, it says forward. Should be a second. Um, in some ways, Auntie and I didn't talk that much about the project as we went along. And I think that, uh, I mean, of course, we did, we, we talked about, um, you know, what type of studio we wanted, and we talked a lot about light. I mean, light was, was um, you know, a sort of dominant uh, discussion. But um, I, I think that we, uh, and, and I've increasingly understood that w we see the world in, in a sort of similar way, and therefore um, a lot of the dialogue that one might normally have, have um, uh, promoted was nearly unnecessary. And uh, what, uh, what seems to me about um, what, what, is, what is possibly common is this idea of the body and the, and the idea of the individual. Um, I'm, I, I find myself at the moment um, slightly uh, um, anxious about um, my my work in relation to the sort of experimentation that's, that's uh, occupying, let's say, the center field of architectural production at the moment. Um, in other words, I'm slightly self-conscious that the work is a little bit uh, dull. Um, and uh, continuously ask myself, you know, why, why can't I be more exciting in that? Uh, yeah. Why can't I do um, you know, funny shapes like everybody else? Uh, and I think that uh, the reason I start with these two, I mean, I, I just, I, I ran to the, to the office to try and just pick some slides very quickly, and I could have picked, an, I think, any number of slides to say the same thing. But um, the, the place, I think, where our work always starts is the idea of you know, experience. And, the idea of how uh, architecture can help you experience the world, and in a way, it's something that you know puts the individual at the centre of this um, process. Uh, I mean, all architects say that, but I think it's I think it's um, fairly genuine in terms of the way our work at least starts. Um, I'm possibly less obsessed with formal invention and more to do with trying to establish links and connections and, and, and confirm uh, qualities which I believe are somehow innate. So I think I also, I'm interested in putting the individual at the center and, and that is, uh, goes back to you know, what Anthony said about space and the way that architecture can manipulate space. So that's, that's one theme that I want to talk about. Can I have... To, uh, okay, I have to uh, these, that, one theme I'm going to talk about is that, and I will continue on that with this. The other theme I want to talk about is the use of typologies. And again, I think this is a little bit the you know, I think there's some, some similarities here that I tend not to um, invent so much as to try and appropriate existing typologies and see how I can use them. And in, in that sense, you know, they are akin to Anthony's use of the body as, a, as something which, you know, is, is um, recognizable and um, has meaning and, and ha has some sort of established figure. So I'm going to talk about the idea of experience, the use of typologies, 
Um, and then I'm going to talk about art space. And those three things sort of conspire into, uh, you know, what quite honestly is a, is a, uh, you know, a very straightforward um, studio project that Auntie and I did together. Um, Moisen asked that I showed this project, so I will explain it a little bit. This was the, this is uh, um, the northwest coast of um, Spain, the Atlantic side of Spain, and this was the piece of land that we, we bought, it's like the um, um, uh, derelict and, and rather sad looking group of buildings. Um, and uh, this is sort of slightly paradoxical situation that in the most beautiful natural environment um, exists some of the ugliest buildings that you can imagine. Um, but the buildings conspire together into some sort of um, uh, form. And they, the buildings conspire together to make uh, this sort of haphazard uh, conglomerate um, village made of uh, disparate forms, disparate materials, and um, strange you know, elevations. But there is a, you know, it represents something. It represents a sort of collection of individual things. And, and I, you know, I, while it has no individual architectural beauty, and the pieces are not beautiful, there is still something very, co you know, strangely coherent about this series of individual um, of constructions. Strangely, we went there because, you know, we wanted to look, well, not strangely, of course, we went there because we were interested in, in the view. Uh, the fishermen that live there uh, were not particularly interested in the view. When fishermen come home from fishing, the last thing they want to do is look at the sea. Um, so there's very little, um, I mean, you can see in these buildings, I mean, that you would never imagine that this these buildings look out onto the ocean. Of course, we wanted to look out on the ocean because the, the view is the reason for being there. Um, the <coughs> the uh, problem, as I saw it, was how to make a building that somehow belonged to this place. It wasn't a sort of spaceship uh, uh, landed, given, especially given it's got different priorities. And on the, on the other hand, of course, it had very different um, reasons. And I was sort of fascinated by this idea of these small windows with this dramatic view, because obviously one of the problems, one of the things that we were going to want to do is put big windows in somehow. And therefore, the question was how to deal with not only this uh, switching of, of priorities, and the, the idea of creating um, a building which had big windows, but secondly, and, and somehow, you know, tuning that with surrounding buildings, and secondly, to deal with surrounding geometries and the surrounding buildings, which, although they are haphazard, conspire to a certain sort of system. Um, and, and the, okay, can, yeah, can I have the next slide? Because um, um, that's the view that you get, um, which was really the reason for being there, and that, you know, goes back to this idea of, you know, really trying to conspire um, architecture and architectural space around priorities which are, which are to do with you know, exp experiencing um, these things. Um, but there was another concern here, which was a formalistic uh, game in a way, which was how to tie the building into the, to this haphazard environment. And, and that was really solved by two devices. One was to uh, include all the, of the surrounding geometries. Um, to, instead of sort of resisting all of the, the lines and geometries of the surrounding buildings, you know, the five-story building here and the three-story building here and the angle here and the angle there and the, the, the law that allows us to project here and the fact that we, you know, there's a setback here. And, um, instead of resisting them, somehow bringing them into the project and, and using those um, lines and existing uh, qualities as a, as a way of um, consolidating the project. And, and secondly, and more importantly probably, is the idea of continuing this sort of small window architecture uh, 
across the building. And this becomes a sort of bridge, somehow tying the silhouette of the village together and, and continuing the sort of compositional character of you know, surface and holes uh, along the facade of the village. Uh, and then, uh, you know, continuing a base which is running all the way around the village with stone and then um, slipping between those two things, a sort of gap. And the back of the house, the street side, is uh, even more so. I mean, all the geometries are, are taken into the building in such a way that the building nearly, although it becomes quite a, a complex and elaborate form, it's one that nearly disappears because it's, it's always continuing and consolidating the strange geometries which are already there. And this shows you how you know, this. And there you can see the sort of stone base which runs through. So there was, <coughs> although this is, um, I would say, this is not, you know, this is much more inventive than the typological examples that I'm going to show, or the, the examples of typologies that I'm going to show. Um, it, was, it was grounded in a number of concerns which were both experiential from the point of view of how you, you, know, you live in the building and how you enjoy the place, but also trying, attempting to find uh, clues uh, you know, in, in the place itself, not just the, the, the bigger geography, but the way to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so the use of um, recognizable forms. Um, this was the first project uh, of any scale. I mean, the sort of first architectural project I did in England. Actually, it's just about the only architectural project uh, I've ever done in England, which was a museum in Henley um, next to the Thames. The competition was in something like 1990 or 1989. Um, it actually took 10 years to realize the project. Uh, and what was, and although it's an incredibly um, flawed project in many ways, it, I, I'm quite fond of it because there was, it was, um, it was sort of form, I would say it's a sort of formative project. That, um, we in encountered at that time an enormous resistance to um, modern architecture. And this was 1990, this was exactly when Prince Charles was uh, at his peak in terms of raving about uh, how awful modern architecture was and l legitimating, you know, sort of the man in the streets um, hate of, of uh, modern architecture. I think things have, have moved on since then, but it was incredibly difficult to um, confront this, the, 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 this sort of atmosphere that existed at that time to try and build a modern building in a very, I mean, Henley is as conservative as, as they can, you know, but it's a sort of bastion of conservatism. And, um, uh, and it, you know, there was sort of Trojan horse quality about this, that it was, um, uh, there was an enormous resistance, and quite honestly, um, it sort of questioned the, the, even, the, the, even the potential of doing a modern building. Um, and at first, I really resented that resistance. I really resented this idea that um, you couldn't just do what you wanted. Um, you know, I'd been to architecture school, and I'd learned that you know, it was just a matter of having enough creativity. It wasn't a matter of... Um, you know, having to deal with stupid planners, um, and especially planners that somehow were trying to um, represent this very conservative um, position. Because at the same time, I was building in Japan, where there was, you know, there was no restriction whatsoever. But finally, what I, I, I sort of realized that there was a sort of um, it, it, this. this force of resistance was, a, was made one really think about, uh, you know, the form of buildings and what, what form means. And, and, and I suppose that the, the, 
the anxiety about modern architecture at that point and why postmodernism was um, in a way so uh, attractive was that it addressed something that modern architecture I think had, had in, in a way forgotten which was some notion of meaning and some idea that things should be recognizable and, and understood and, and that's something which I'm very concerned about in architecture that there, you know, things mean something whether that's an experiential uh, uh, process or whether it's to do also with figure and, and form so in this sense this was a uh, for me a, <coughs> a lesson you know a sort of a project where um, I accepted the idea of taking uh, an understood typology an understood form sort of the wooden barn and investing that with uh, other qualities, qualities that might not be uh, normally associated with that, to exaggerate things. To, uh, in fact, the process that we had to adopt on this building was to put it through planning permission two times, because the first time we actually got an acceptance for the form, and the second time we were able to adjust <coughs> all the details in a very untraditional way. But the first process, we weren't even allowed to adjust. You know, we had to even adopt um, traditional details. Um, <coughs> so this was a. This is an example of a, of in a way appropriating a typology, um, using that typology, and then playing with it and exaggerating it and um, emphasizing certain qualities. Uh, this was a house that we designed in, uh, for a client in Martha's Vineyard. <coughs> and um, in fact, we, I think the hold is still there. It hasn't, uh, we, we got to the point of um, digging the hole ready to build it. Uh, and Martha's Vineyard, and this side of Martha's Vineyard, it has, a, has a nearly sort of agricultural um, atmosphere. And again, it was a beautiful landscape. And people were building I mean, it's very interesting to see how, how people were spending money on large houses and what type of forms that they were appropriating or using to make um, you know, uh, holiday homes and, and uh, large uh, houses. And this was an idea of taking, again, nearly a, you know, an existing, nearly a sort of barn form and then exaggerating it and making it... Um, you know, as minim minimal as possible in terms of its material. It was clad in zinc on the, on the faces and the, and the roof, <coughs> and therefore there was no gutter, so it was, you know, the rain just runs down the facade. And then because the view um, was so spectacular, there was an, an immediate tendency to <coughs> make the biggest window possible, which again is sort of tendency of the sort of seaside holiday homes. Um, but here, I wanted to in a way, stabilize the building so that the internal space, the quality of the internal space, this was for uh, a collector of paintings, by the way, that you know, was very keen on having uh, walls and, and, and uh, rooms inside the building for art. And therefore, I was fascinated by the idea that even though you had this extraordinary view, that, that the windows just gave you these sort of glimpses and became like columns. So the view was always there and that you didn't um, sort of collapse in, in a celebration of this view, but you, you actually restrained it, and you found a balance between this extraordinary view and making these windows, which were, um, you know, human size. If you like. There's something very nice about windows <coughs> from the point of view of their proportions, because they are, they are, you know, have some relationship to, to the human figure. So, I, the, you know, the idea of the, the windows became an important element and, and we avoided the abstraction of the window into something else. We, we tried to play the typology of the form and the typology of windows. Um, this is a villa in, in uh, Berlin. Um, again, the, the, the commission was for a house. It was really, the decision was just to say, well, let's just do a, a brick villa. Let's not do anything more complicated than the brick villa. But then, having said that, how can we make an exercise out of making a brick villa? How can we, <coughs> how can we safeguard ourselves from, um, you know, bad brickwork? I mean, the, the problem with brickwork now is that it's, it's often has, 
contradictory in, in, a, sort of in a rather paradoxical way. It actually, is normally very unmaterial. You know. So, because brickworks become sort of industrialized and synthetic, and the way that we build buildings obviously means that we no longer use brick as load bearing, and therefore there's a tendency for the brickwork to become <coughs> a sort of surface. Um, so this was an exercise in in uh, brickiness, I suppose, how to how to make <coughs> the um, the project about you know how, how to make apparent this um, the materiality and that <coughs> the, again it's a simple volume which, where the proportions are exaggerated so that the ground floor is four and a half meters and the, and the bedroom is is two and a half the, the any sort of recess <coughs> that's a balcony that's an alley which cuts through to the courtyard on the front of the building every surface is clad in brick even the undersides so we hung brick from the soffits so that you don't get this rather nash detail where the brick stops and then you get another material <coughs> but it's a you know it's a it's a replay of the brick villa you know, the sort of Mendelssohn in these brick villa this was Berlin it was from politician. So I was, I was sort of interested in, in a way just taking that <coughs> um, typology and playing it again, you know, just sort of seeing how one could, <coughs> and that the, the formal games were to do with material and proportion and views and space and were, you know, nothing much more ambitious than that. Um, <coughs> in a similar vein, this was a, uh, a commission for a very nice company in, uh, uh, near Dusseldorf, between Dusseldorf and Münster, <coughs> um, a sort of rag trade company <coughs> uh, owned by, <coughs> uh, still owned by, um, you know, family. And the, uh, the owner was a sort of patriarchal figure in the, in the family, he was very, very concerned about his workforce and the conditions they lived in. I mean, very, very sweet, in fact, I mean, very nice. And we just, and again, we just, I sort of borrowed <coughs> the sort of 1960s, um, uh, uh, nearly uh, Skidmore and Owings, Skidmore Owings Merrill architecture, you know, the sort of American campus um, uh, office building. This, this is very much a campus environment. It's not an urban, it's, you know, sort of in the woods nearly. <coughs> um, where we could really exploit the views in and out of the building, that you could set a building in a landscape, it had no other, there were no other clues apart from this rather um, simple landscape. Uh, Peter Wirtz worked with us on the, <coughs> on the immediate landscape around the building. But again, it was a simple <coughs> typology of the two-story uh, office building in, in a sort of uh, landscape park. And then the, then the game was, you know, proportion, material, views, all of those things. These are <coughs> this is all made out of precast concrete elements, uh, single pieces. So there's a sort of Stonehenge-like quality of how this building is assembled. And the qualities come, you know, its, it's, it's presence and its quality comes very simply from, from uh, you know, its materiality and its form and its shape and its spaces. Um, <coughs> we have a number of projects in Italy and um, Yesterday, a journalist in, in Italy was asking me why, did, you know, why had we been so successful in getting commissions in Italy, and I think that the, the sort of the agreement was that <coughs> that we do that the projects start from um, <coughs> an idea about what something should be like. You know, this is the law courts of Salerno, and this is for an, it's an enormous building, 70,000 square meters. Um, and what I was concerned with <coughs> was that the um, that the status of the um, of authority in, in uh, Italy is, <coughs> as you well know, um, you know questionable. I mean, the, the, there's so little <coughs> um, there's so little um, confidence in in, uh, in politicians and any other structure. But the quality of Italy re relies in the individual. It's the it's the daily life that saves Italy, not Berlusconi. You know. We think Tony Blair's a liar, but compared to um, 
Tony Blair. I mean, Berlusconi t tells 50 lies a day, and, and yet <coughs> the country somehow accepts it because they don't expect anything else. Um, you know, that's what politicians do. And so there's, there's, a, there's a lack of, of um, trust. And there's these, you know, sort of two systems in Italy. You know, the daily life is, is you know, and, and the way that individuals act, I think, is, you know, saves the country. And there's a, there's a complete lo loss of confidence in, in authority. So this was at the time, and this was a competition at the time of, you know, the clean hands, man, the, the clean hands um, uh, purge, where, you know, the whole society was really being, you know, tr trying, trying to extract itself from, you know, obvious corruption. Um, and therefore, <clears throat> my question was, how do you make a more humane uh, courthouse? How do you make a courthouse that doesn't look as if it's about authority, but it's about justice. How do you make a, a, a law court that might be, yes, might, might accommodate the individual, you know, might think about how, as an individual, you approach it, whether you're going to see your brother, you know, for, you know, on trial for something, or whether you're going to get a dog license. Not that I think you need a dog license and so on. Um, <coughs> and there were two strategies. Before we even start, I mean, again, this has got nothing to do with architecture in a way, it's just, you know, and we, you know, before we even started to define what the architecture should be, the strategy was, let's break the volume, let's take the 70,000 square meters and make it a conglomerate of volume so that the expression of the building is, is less formidable, because that was one anxiety. And the second anxiety I had was that such big public buildings are, um, connected and uh, structured around endless corridors. And these corridors are as intimidating as the buildings are in terms of their, you know, their sense of authority. So having broken the buildings up, given that we were in Salerno and given that we were in a climate which is very ambient, um, we proposed that you actually didn't really put them back together again, but you link them. These are um, separate volumes. You link them with courtyards. The, the, the reference was um, the cloister of Santa Chiara in, in Naples, where you get this wonderful majolica and tiled um, gardens. And so, <coughs> in order to, you enter here or you enter here, and the connection between the, um, the project, between this front door, is always going through a building and through a courtyard, and then through a courtyard and then through a courtyard. So, the courtyards, the gardens are the thing which connects the buildings and therefore your experience of the building will be informed just as much by this idea of moving through courtyards as it is. And, and I think that, I mean, we won the competition really on that strategy of saying, <coughs> question the form and, and question the structure and in a way make, try and make a more humane uh, building. Um, that's in construction, by the way. I'm not showing any more of it, but <coughs> the second project that we won on, in, in a way the same basis was the extension of the cemetery in, in Venice. The original island uh, was around the, the, um, the monastery and the beautiful church, uh, San Michele here, it's one of the nicest churches in Venice, I think. Um, there was originally an island here and then there was a second small island here. Then, <coughs> as it became a cemetery, these were linked up and in the 19th century it was expanded and it's gone through phases of expansion. The burial system in Italy is one of burying the bones in walls. And the expansion phases recently have, um, de have built what I call sort of library system. So these walls are in a sort of uh, serial uh, library order. So when you go to look for your grandmother's tomb, you know, you're going down corridors of, of um, like bookshelves. Um, from the outside, it's the most wonderful romantic image, you know, the, the island of the deaf, but from the inside, it's rather municipal and uh, surprisingly unromantic in these places, and I felt that was... Um, the island has been extended and extended, and you can see that was a system, and it was, th this, miss this corner was missing, and they were about to complete that. The mayor of, of uh, Venice at the time, Cacciari, Massimo Cacciari, saw these projects and, and stopped it and, and announced an international competition, which we won. And, and we, we won it, really, on this sketch. And, and I said, well, if you're going to build walls, why build them in 
in series, why not build them and make spaces? And then those spaces can define uh, courtyards on the inside and passages and, and you know, in Ven Calais, in Venice, you know, these alleys and, and squares. And, and then <coughs> you create a sense of space and that each, you know, each group of walls is built round a garden. So the whole experience becomes again more humane. And that's the first phase. This is now in construction, which happens here. These, it, it went, this was the competition sketch. We then subdivided these blocks into three or four. So now you see each block is made out of four, um, four or three courtyards. Each court has a slightly different quality. Some have stone floors and others have grass and others have lavender and trees, olive tree. So then there's a, cha a chapel here and then a sort of arrival point here. And then the second phase which we're now working on is the construction of this island which will have a, a, a different density of burial walls. So the walls then become these things. So there's more of a park here. <coughs> these are one story courtyards and these are three and four story tomb blocks and that density allows us to keep the rest of the island much more open. But again, I mean, in a way, <coughs> it's nearly as if the architecture became irrelevant. The first, the, you know, the, the move of saying, <coughs> I think that's what, event, what a cemetery should be like, <coughs> was really the strategy and that's why, you know, the competition was won. This is a, a detail of how the <coughs> the, um, one of these courtyards would look. This is all precast concrete. And then this is stone. <coughs> okay, it's a strange order. I know. Okay, art space. <coughs> um, the, uh, we have done a number of museum projects and, and a number of projects for. Um, galleries and, and, and museums, <coughs> some of which are scientific museums and, and a number of art museums. This is a early studies we did for a project we won in Berlin, a series of galleries, and these were studies for light. And we have a highly opinionated and rather um, educated client, has very precise ideas about light, and, and um, although <coughs> we won the competition, he hated the lighting. Um, and we thought we'd come up with a rather clever solution of clear story top lighting by sort of moving the floors backwards and forwards. Um, but <coughs> I've got a feeling these slides are out of order. I think they're going to come back. Yeah, I'm, so I, I'll come back to that. I mean, he. he <coughs> I'll, I'll come back to those two slides. Just hold those slides in your hand. Uh, this is a, another studio project we did in Dusseldorf. The building, the building on the left was by Stephen Hull, the middle was by. Uh, Ingenhoven from, uh, from Dusseldorf and then this block, this small tower at the end was <coughs> a project we did which was a series of um, double height studios that faced on to the, for the, to the Dockland on this side and then faced the river on the other side. This is looking from the, from the, from the harbour side and <coughs> The buildings of the docks were being replaced. Um, there were these sort of, uh, you can see in the background, you know, very sort of honest, grimy um, industrial buildings. And they were gradually being replaced. I can't, you, know, you can't see them so well, but there's you know, typical glass uh, office buildings that could be anywhere, um, rather you know, in the same way that's happened in the Docklands here. And, and I argued for, um, a building which had a lot of mass. You know, I, was, I was interested in a way putting a slightly dirty building back, um, you know, using very rough concrete and maintaining some of the sort of presence that the industrial architecture had, albeit in you know, completely different forms. So this is all uh, <coughs> precast concrete, uh, sorry, in situ concrete construction sitting on these four columns. And then it, it's the building is made out of these, these sort of two characteristics. These are all double height spaces. These are the double height spaces which go uh, north-south, as it were, because the canal, the, the dock is on the north side, this is the south side. So these are sort of through 
double night spaces, and then each studio gets two floors here. So it's a, that's one unit, that's one unit, that's one unit, and then that's the top floor, which is that unit here. So you get sort of mezzanine. Yeah. Um, and I was interested in this sort of texture, trying to get the building back that could sit slightly more comfortably, but it's sort of industrial character. Of it. And this is the top studio, which is a beautiful space. Um, this is the um, gallery we're building in Berlin. This is Alta's museum here. This is the back of Alta's museum. This is, uh, I will say, our Neues museum. Uh, this is the project we're now in construction, which is the, re, re, um, the rebuilding of the Neues museum, which was built by Stuhl as an extension of the um, Alta's. And we have this site here, which is right on the edge of this um, incredible uh, um, representational you know, collection of, of uh, museum buildings and the cathedral and uh, the Humboldt University and the old Schloss was here. So our building is here. Um, it just sits, you know, and it's made of stone with these different windows. And <coughs> if you go back in your mind, the slides I showed before, which were top light, um, this is the development that's happened with the with a client who's absolutely adamant that, um, as he would say in a very Germanic way, light comes through windows. Um, and uh, and th there's a certain sense about that and a certain directness which I rather like, and it's something very difficult normally to, um, uh, I mean, most museums are not interested in that statement. I mean, light through windows is a great problem normally for showing art. Um, but uh, he's right in some way, you know, that's what windows are for, they are the, the, you know, the eyes of the building. And, um, you know, there was, a, there was something very, there was a great relief when we, we came to such a straightforward solution that if you've got galleries and you want light, why bring it down chimneys and why sort of get things, you know, why not just have a window? Why, why be so complicated about it? And that's where we, and, and the idea is to, um, create very white spaces and <coughs> um, use as much of the uh, daylight to, to spill around. I mean, that he's, he's, again, it, you know, you need someone set with a certain boldness to say, well, I'm not so worried about getting shadows in, into the room. I'm not so worried. We can, you know, obviously we're going to have artificial light, but it's not going to be an artificial light that tries to simulate, um, you know, some sort of perfect lighting condition. Okay, so um, <coughs> this is Anthony's studio. It sits in an industrial and really grotty area, to be honest. <coughs> An industrial wasteland, I would say. Uh, up and coming King's Cross, it sits. <coughs> uh, you know, this is going to be the new uh, area of London. Very exciting. Another 20 years or so. Uh, <coughs> uh, but, but Anthony's there before anybody else, uh, showing the way. Uh, but we are surrounded by, you know, industrial sheds. <coughs> and um, I suppose really there were, there were two questions in the project. <coughs> what should the working environment be like? And I think, you know, Anthony was very clear about that. Uh, and what should the form be like, and ideally shouldn't those two things somehow come together. Um, <coughs> Anthony was very adamant in the end about the sort of light, I mean, in, in the same way that, you know, we have someone in Berlin telling us that light only comes through windows. Um, Anthony feels that for working, you know, the light should be even and just dropping on his head like you know, a sheet. <coughs> and therefore, ideas of north light or asymmetric light were, were rejected in favor of really a classical picture of skylight. So, you know, behind these pictures are very simple um, uh, double skylights <coughs> that just drop light down into these spaces. Um, 
<coughs> so that became, you know, again, after lots of discussion, I think that became one of, you know, a very clear decision. And it, to some degree, it supported a decision about the outside, and these two things obviously worked separately and together in some way, you know, what should the building look like? <coughs> um, but I think <coughs> we, we uh, jumped on in some ways, because I, I think, our, you know, in the, in the beginning, we did, I confess, we came up with solutions which were more like galleries, I would say, more like <coughs> museums with slightly more complicated light strategies about how light comes in, and sort of more <coughs> rectangular forms that weren't so, um, you know, explicit in their, in their language, much more minimal, I suppose. But I'd rather, you know, I, I'm rather convinced by this um, <coughs> idea that the building takes on a semi-industrial quality, and it does become, you know, a typology. It, does, it is a sort of reworking of the Victorian warehouse. <coughs> the other thing it does, which is quite interesting, is that inside this building is a number of different spaces. Um, you know, there's a smaller working room up here, and there's a, there's a small room here, and there's a smaller room there, and there's a, ga there's a workshop under here, and then those three bays are one big room. <coughs> and quite interestingly, the, the scale of this roofing element, the scale of the skylight, works as you know, an individual element, but also in relationship to a big space, which you'll see inside. Um, the other important decision was the idea of setting the building at the back of the site and leaving a big space in front, which in my opinion is one of the strongest parts of the project. It's a sort of enormous concrete apron, and the concrete <coughs> apron has a, has a strange physical presence. It is, it's more than just a floor. It somehow seems to um, you know, be a plate. That, you know. And I think <coughs> that becomes more than a floor and more than just the, the forecourt because we made a decision to take the stairs out of the building and put the stairs outside. Um, partly just to discomfort the artist slightly so that <coughs> every time he has to go upstairs, he has to go in the rain and <coughs> you know, get out, out of his sort of luxurious um, headquarters here when he gets so kind of, um, But it's quite fascinating, to, you know, but partly to, in a way, go back to that tradition of, of industrial buildings where staircases were on the outside. But what it does also is to turn this into a room because, you know, this is the staircase hall, if you like. I mean, these two stairs, I mean, without those stairs, this wouldn't feel like the space it does. So these stairs, which have this sort of slightly heroic and over. <coughs> and, <coughs> you know, Anthony was very nervous because he thought they were too sculptural. You know. And, uh, but, and, and they are, they're slightly exaggerated, but they do, I think they successfully animate the space, and I do think that they, well, I, don't, I would say that because I don't actually have to run up and down the stairs all day, I'm sure Auntie's got another opinion, but I, I, <coughs> I do think it brings the building, the, you know, the sort of activities that go on in the building in a, in a very different um, uh, way than if you have <coughs> more convenient stairs inside the building. So that's the, you know, this is the courtyard. <coughs> there are the stairs that set up. And this is the, you know, that's the module of the, the roof. And here there are three together, and there's two here and two here. And that door is obviously this door. This, this door. I think one of the discussions we had at the time, and we've had since, <coughs> is um, concern more on my, from my side than Anthony's that um, in some details, in some ways that we treated the building, <coughs> um, it's probably, I, I think we set out to do certain um, <coughs> details that, which are more um, familiar to a sort of gallery environment than they are to a workshop environment. And I, and I wonder we shouldn't have been a little bit more robust in some of that detailing. Um, <coughs> Anthony's adamant that, for instance, the walls um, 
should be uh, plasterboard and painted white. They shouldn't have been rougher than that because that would have given you know, other problems. <coughs> um, and you know, the space is designed to take <coughs> loads <coughs> off the roof, but also to be fixed to the walls. <coughs> And this, you know, this is the big space with the roof lights, and, and you can see. I, I, you know, I think the roof um, thing works very well for, for the big space as well. So. <coughs> this is the sort of weather they get up in the King's Cross. No photographs of the artist at work. There are always other people working in your studio, aren't there? No evidence of you in any of these. <coughs> I think that's it. Okay. <coughs> I think the idea was that there would be a sort of um, questions and <coughs> Talks. I'm wondering, where, I mean, th I'm sure there are going to be some questions, and I'm wondering <coughs> whether we should sit down and face the audience and each other at the same time. Shall I sit down and you can remain you, standing? If you sit down, you're about the same height as me standing. <laughs> <coughs> I'm, I'm very interested in this, um, this man in Berlin that says, let the light come through the windows, because uh, that's what windows are for. Because <coughs> so far as I'm concerned, both the museum and the studio, in a way where the, where the world is reinvented, not where, in a way, you look back at the world from. And, I mean, I used, I used the, 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 the windows in the Cologne <coughs> Kinsbrine very consciously because that was possible. In a sense, that was about making, making the institution porous and in a way questioning its identity. But certainly for me, I mean, to answer your rhetorical question about what <coughs> artists require of a museum, I think that the, the most important thing is there is silence. Uh, there is a contain, a containment of the atmosphere. And that, that in a way, a, a, a museum, if we're talking about typology, you know, aspires, in a way, to the to the condition of the cloister in a, in a monastery. It aspires to the condition of a place that has, in a way, turned its back on the world, in order for it to be reinvented. And I I actually, you know, I know there's been a lot of griping about Tate Modern, but I think it's fantastic the way that almost in you know, a Babylonian kind of ziggurat-like way, that, that mass of bricks and that blindness of the walls and its history as a, as a power station, which is also, in a sense, metaphoric, um, is, a, is a perfect uh, object that turns its back on the world in a way. You, 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 admittedly, we with that, with that building, we inherited a kind of stand-alone uh, industrial monumentalism. But in spite of maybe the feeling that the space is in, in, inside a too regimented, in other words, they're too serial, I think, well, the fact that it is uh, so used, the fact that people seem to need the spaces that are offered there. Um, I mean, I, I think it is a, it, 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 it's an extraordinary valediction of uh, how that kind of, I don't know, it, 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 it is a, an aloofness from the world that the, that the building presents um, actually, except actually it's works. Over, except it's overrun by people. Yeah, no, so but that's, you know, but that... The leaf is not the first word that comes to 
9.2%. Well, no, I think the, 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 <coughs> the, the kind of persona of the building and how it's used are in almost direct contradiction. But that's but very, very that's interesting. It suggests to me that that is because people need that sense of a, a place apart. But I think that's where <coughs> the, the room idea got wrong. There. I mean, Nick Sirota defined very at the beginning of the competition that rooms should be roughly that size. And they were based on the existing rooms in the Tate, in the old Tate, the sort of 19th century rooms. <coughs> because he felt um, that uh, a clear room structure was the easiest structure to work with. But I think in the meantime, the t because of the new um, role of museums as a sort of leisure destination, you know, and a day out, um, the museum has to cope with another type of traffic, which that room, in my opinion, the room structure doesn't work for very well. It doesn't, you know, because the big drama of the turbine hall is forgotten as soon as you move out of it. I mean, it's fantastic, the turbine hall, for that reason that it does accommodate this sort of destination, leisure thing. And when, when, um, it was the artist that did the sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Olafur Elias. Yeah. But it's <coughs> extraordinary that, that you say that, because I, I, th I think you're wrong, because I was there the other night, and from level five, I, I don't know how well you, you know the tape, but from level five, there's that, there's that sunken seating area where you look down, and it's, it's fantastic now with Olafur's piece, because everybody's lying on yeah. the floor doing all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's really... But when you're in the white room, Anthony, you have no, you do not get any credit. You get no benefit from you get no benefit whatsoever. You've left that, and you're now in, in in white rooms. And I think that the increment of those spaces is too claustrophobic for the sort of traffic. I mean, and it's no good, in a way, it's no good. I mean, I I can see that you know the success of the takes being its own. Mm. You know, but I, I don't think you can separate the two things. You can't say, well, it's fine. It's just it's too many people. But, you know, that's, <coughs> that's no, but I, think I just, I think there's something wrong with the spatial structure because I think that the, those rooms are, are, are too tight for the, and, and, and I suppose the reason for mentioning this is because I think that one of the things that museums have to deal with now is not only, you know, um, the sort of sacred space that you're talking about, it's actually the very unsacred space, the, the fact that museums are now dealing with a, a, an enormous audience that are coming in a very diff with very different motives mm. and very diverse motives, um, and and I think that so you would give them a few <coughs> courtyards to kind of um, you know chill out in, or, or um, you know you wouldn't Possibly, you yeah. would have taken the roof off the uh, the turbine hall, or you would have you would have maybe opened up some balconies onto the turbine hall, or no, no, sorry, I'm not. I'm not mm. Well, first of all, I think the galleries are I like in in my opinion sort of too conventional from that point. I, I understand why Nick went there, because he got frightened by the sort of experimentation that had gone on in museum design and given all sorts of museums um, you know, a headache in terms of having too much uh, architectural innovation and not enough just sort of straightforward. You know, so I think at that point, Nick said to the architects, don't get, you know, please don't get stuck on complex solutions of daylight, like the uh, Tate extension of the 60s and 70s. Don't get stuck on moving walls and all that stuff. Just give me, you know, if you can't do anything better, just give me some white rooms and I, I'll do the rest. And, um, and I can see why he did it, but I actually think in the end uh, it's, it's been a limitation on the qualities. Because when I think of the tape, I think of the turbine hall and I think of the staircases along the edge. But when, as soon as I think about the white rooms. Yes, there's no distinction. And there isn't enough. I there is, like, there just like isn't enough, no. in a way sense of narrative. But that, I, that's, you know, it's an architectural problem on the one hand, but I, what I'm trying to say is that I think <coughs> you've said what do, you know, what do artists want out of a museum, if they want to sort of calm and, and quiet. And, you know, how do you marry that with this new uh, role of museums as, you know, a day out? Well, I think your Salerno, um, you know, law court solution um, would be perfect. 
Yeah, they're not meant to be a day out of the court. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but I'm interested. I mean, I'm interested that you what you made there was a number of closed volumes that are connected. I mean, I can I can see that that model might work extremely well. Um, well, it works there because of the climate. Yeah. Not here. But anyway, I, w I want to talk a bit about um, studios and how they've changed. I think that, the, you know, for me, the, the, the great um, pleasure of going to Paris has to be seeing Brancusi's studio. And I'm very aware that there are similarities and really quite big differences between mine and his, primarily one size. <laughs> um, and the fact that I don't sleep in my studio, and Frank Hussey did sleep in his. Um, but I think that, that, for me, the studio is a place of enormous concentration. I work with six full-time assistants. And in a way, I want the life within the studio to be uh, yeah, completely self-absorbed, but at the same time to be a reflection up upon itself. So, so that, that, that thing that David was talking about, the relationship between the courtyard and the closed space, is, is, is a very important one. You, by going outside, the, in a way, the, the, that thing of moving from, say, the office, has a very particular atmosphere. It is about, in a way, archive, about administration, um, and also about the other form of imaging, the, the, the virtual world. But you move from that back into the common, in a way, elemental world, and then into another zone. And there are two major zones. One is the workshop. Um, it might be helpful to, to, to have the slide back up of, of uh, that, that very first slide. That, that well, I've learned how to go forward. I think I've learned how to go back. Um, but anyway, the e each, of, each of those spaces, that would do. Tell me when. Yeah. Uh, go back to the Um, we need, we need, mm. yeah, I was thinking of the very first, yeah, okay, that'll do, that'll do, yeah, perfect. So, <coughs> the, the, this is really the high, kind of, high-end technology department. This is where, this is where we've got the turret drills, where we've got um, all of the metal racks, um, where we've got the engineering table and the carpentry table, um, and it has four, um, really he heavy duty beams that can, that, that can take two and a half tons each of weight. Here we have a, it's 10 meters up to the, up to the ridge. There's provision for a beam crane, but actually we're using these two transverse beams that equally can take two, two tons load, and they have two traveling cranes on each. But the fact is that the, the, you know, these areas that are, there, there's an office here, and then we use this space here, which is about two thirds of the depth. The building is, is 13, between 13 and 14 meters deep. Um, it's divided exactly into half, so there are two six and a half meter cubes here that is the office, and then behind is the library. And here it's about, um, eight and a half, nine meters deep is really the communal area which has a kitchen in it and we use for discussions, for uh, looking at projects, but we also have lunch in there every day. The, these, there are, there are two, there's one more pitch here and this is my private studio and my wife's, Rick and Carson's, the, the painter's studio next door and below that are two other spaces, one for the photographing of work. And the one below here, which has its own uh, road that for the delivery and taking away of 
the delivery of materials and the taking away of finished sculpture, which means that in theory the, the, the courtyard itself should be available really as a, as a working space and I imagine that in the summer we will do so. We've, we've, we've got a couple of pieces there at the moment. But I very much like the idea that, that you know, this is in a sense a huge landing or a huge hallway that is animated every day by people running up and down. It is actually quite slow, this staircase. It does take, it takes quite a long time <laughs> to get... I, I did ask David, I said, why, why do we have to have three uh, flights? Why can't it be just all in one go? And apparently that's a, that is a building regulation. But, um, sculptural, it's a sculptural consideration. The, um, but anyway, it's, 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 it's a huge pleasure, actually, because it, it slows you down. You know, you, and, and, and it's very, very nice, the feeling of both going up and coming down. It, it, it sort of gives you time to think about what you're going to do. <laughs> you um, the, um, but I, I suppose what I, what I wanted to say about the, about the staircases is, you know, for, for, for David, there are, in a way, they're a signature, aren't they? They're, kind of like a nice graphic element that goes across the facade. For us, I think they're, they're um, really the, the kind of artery of the life of the studio. And they're almost like sluices, you know. They're, 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 they're like gutters that are holding a kind of fluid, the fluid element of the life of, of the building. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see how, how, how it evolves. The fact, is, the fact is that I think the studio life has changed from, uh, in a way, you know, one person working maybe with one or two helpers, but definitely in uh, a personal space to something which is much, much more collaborative. And I see, I, I see the studio really as a kind of family, or a, anyway, it's a, it's a collective of individuals who have come together um, because of mutual interest. Uh, and my, I, I mean, my ambition for this is that it should also be, in, in, in a sense, a, a, a place where you don't just make things, but you think things as well. You use what you make as a, a, in, in, in a way, a focus for, for reflection. And so, even though it, it has this industrial uh, idiom, uh, typo typology, um, I think there's also this, this, this sense of a, I don't know, um, maybe a, a some, somewhere between a, a, a kind of courtyard in a university uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a laboratory. My children are indicating it's getting late. <coughs> it is getting late, isn't it? You talked for too long, David. <laughs> <coughs> I'm sure there's going to be some questions. Come on, let's have a few questions and then we'll all go and have a drink. I'm local, I'm just down the road from it. I'm the closest, yeah, I'm that's close, a, that's a very I'm the closest architect to the site. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it was even more of a dump. I think that David's already talked about it very, very eloquently. I think that David doesn't, uh, doesn't try too hard. I think he allows, <laughs> he allows things to find their own form. I think it's a very remarkable 
there's a, there's a, I mean, he talks about typologies. I think there's a, there's a, there's a kind of, isn't there, the, the philosophy of daily life that somehow, with inscribed within the spaces that human beings have found necessary to create, is an understanding about how people live, how people, in a way, maybe aspire to live as well. And I think that what I love about what David does is that he has. You know, he has a huge respect, I think, for the, f the forms that life can take and an ability to marry them with an understanding of materials and the way that materials want to behave. So for me, you know, the, the unbuilt project for Doris Sarchi, the, 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 uh, the, the house in Maine that, that he showed very early on, I mean, it's, it, it's a... It's just exemplary in the way that it, he's taking, taken a absolutely vernacular idiom, a material that is commonly used for roofing and, and in a way, in farm buildings, and examine its potential to be, in a way, more than itself. Um, and there's a lovely, I, th I think there's a lovely consistency in the way that... Uh, he looks at, yeah, the, 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 in a way, the choreography of activity and then marries that with a notion of, of uh, yeah, appropriate material. So, again, with that, that factory, the, the factory building, the way that those great, he called it Stonehenge-like, but those, those great slabs of precast concrete work together in a completely logical way, but also in a, in, in, in a way that celebrates place. I think that's another <coughs> extraordinary ability that David has, that his, his buildings belong to their site. I think when he was explaining about the house in, in Galicia, you know, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was beautiful the way that, that you, in that case, were using the idioms uh, that surrounded the site and then, in a way, giving them conscious form uh, through, the, through, through the volumes and the facade. I think that in other, in other projects, it's much more, and, and certainly in, in the making of my studio, it's very much more about in a way establishing very quietly but assuredly the, the way that this object going to sit in the world and, and David's decision to make the building uh, stand alone uh, it just sits in that space and this was very useful for me it's very important that actually you can circumnavigate the building that you can move materials all around and but that you can also walk all the way around it it, it it makes sense but it also means that there's a sense in which the the, the the building as a, a thing that has its own life is made much more potent. Anyway, those are some of the reasons um, that I... Yeah, I, I like him too. <coughs> You're not going to ask me why I accepted the commission. <laughs> Thank you. I think um, aesthetically the building's a great success. It has, it has symmetry and, uh, and it's beautiful. And I think that you've described that you, you enjoy working in the building very well. So aesthetically it's a success. But um, for, many, for many people there are other criteria for success as well. Um, rather more mundane ones like uh, being completed on time and within budget. Um, and I don't suppose it should cost any more to, to build a beautiful building and a beautiful studio than an ugly one. I want you to comment on that. 
Are you putting us on the spot here? <laughs> um, we were on budget on time. Yeah, I mean, it's it just an evolving budget and an evolving <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> it was good that we had a bit of both, though, wasn't it? I mean, because we did start thinking that we were going to make a corrugated iron shed. Um, but then it became apparent that that actually wasn't going to do the job. It was just not capable of taking the load. And what, what's interesting, what, what David was saying about the, the apron, the, the front, the front concrete slab is that that is, that is an object because we built off existing piles. They had, there had been planning permission to build a six-story office block on the site and the piles had been put in in 1989 uh, for that building. And it, I, I don't know whether it's um, a, a kind of, you know, the result of knowing that that makes one feel that the, that the ground um, is, in, is in some sense made. What's this got to do with the question? What? <laughs> You're not answering his question. Um, no, I am really, because I'm, <laughs> I'm just telling him that it's very solid. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the point, there was a criteria there was that, a was that, that was that you should be able to put, you know, a, a five-ton object down anywhere, and uh, that took longer. The thing not not to crack, <laughs> and so the the, uh, the the slab is a whatever 250 uh, mil thick. <laughs> it's just going to tell you about the slab, whatever. With about 80 tons of steel in it, which is unusual. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, therefore, if it, ex if it costs a little bit more than, uh, you know, the tarmac um, front patio that maybe would have been appropriate. I, I think the strange thing about the project is we started off with the idea that we could appropriate an industrial shed maker, that we could literally go to, to a sort of vernacular construction process, you know, we could find the shed builder and upgrade that into a, you know, a deluxe shed. And it was impossible. I and mean, it was, you know, it's like, you, you just, and because that was, and I think that was a really nice idea to try and find nearly a standardized, nearly a pre-made industrial building, that you could find that, um, you know, you could go out of the normal um, construction company, you know, get, get, get away from that way of um, you know, contractor process and try and find somewhere in the north of England <laughs> where they still make factories. Uh, <coughs> um, you know, a, a sort of constructional um, uh, system that we could appropriate. And we tried doing that. It was impossible. And, and in the end, I mean, I think that, that's been, so in a way we did it, we ended up having to do it the other way around. We, you know, we ended up with, well, you know, we, we did end up with a fairly primitive contractor in his thing. He's not in the room, I hope. Uh, maybe. <coughs> <Probably>. um, <laughs> no, I think that we, we got a lot, you know, in a way I think that for, for the design and construction of the project, it always wobbled between this uh, first ambition, which was to have a sort of deluxe shed, and another position, which was to sort of have a basic gallery. And We've ended up, you know, we started off with the idea of sort of deluxing a shed, and we ended up, in a way, sort of stripping down a, a gallery. And I, and I think that did cause constructional issues. I mean, that, that was, you know, it was a complicated build. You know, it was sort of more complicated than it should have been. And again, because of, you know, concrete aprons and <laughs> loading problems and all of those things. So, it could, I mean, there, there's a lot of, as Anthony would carry on telling you about if you want. <laughs> there's a lot of structure in the roof and there's a lot of structure in the walls. It is, a, it is amazing that when you go to, <laughs> no, well when you go to Turin, you see beautifully constructed factories that are made out of precast units or, anyway, uh, available off-the-shelf elements. And that just doesn't pertain here. We have wet trades. We have people who are very good at doing you know, rain screen construction. But actually, things that, well, uh, we, 
we tried, but it, it just wasn't possible. And I, you know, I, I, I look with admiration at the, uh, the Dusseldorf factory um, with those huge precast concrete elements. Um, but actually, I mean, having said all that, I think that what we've got is a building that's much more adaptable than it would have been had it been made in that way. The actual, you know, we, we could have made it in, in uh, cast in situ concrete, but I think it would have been very, very difficult then to make further adjustments. And I imagine that I may well decide that maybe an extra window wouldn't be a better one. <laughs> Any more questions? I have sort of few observations as well as having a question directly. Um, it's interesting how um, you're a sort of well-renowned artist, um, the ability for you to express your ideas in a, um, in a manner that we can all understand. It's very sort of user-friendly. And I wonder how much that is part of um, what we really have to learn if we're architects or artists, um, the ability within the sort of postmodern world to be able to express express ourselves coherently within the English language, um, and whether it's um, it's really our ability to or have the ability to have self-expression and really define what we're saying, and that's really more than really our art in a way. It's the ability to express ourselves and whether that's a sort of core fundament fundamental. And it's just an observation on just watching the both of you and David um, express your creativity, which is um, sort of legitimate on both, on understanding both of you. But at the same time, it's, um, I see that you seem to be sort of more user friendly and that's the, anyway, that seems to be, you know, I mean, that's just sort of the observation. Um, going down to a question, I mean, you, um, you went to Ampleforth, you're sort of Catholic. I've read in your past, um, I've read that you've, you sort of equate Catholicism with energy, of energy of, um, of humankind or... I think we better stop you there. I, 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 uh, <coughs> no, I, I did have the uh, great fortune to go to a, to go to a Catholic uh, monastic uh, school, but I am no longer a Catholic. Uh, I'm not um, even a, a Christian. Um, I think. The, I mean, I think that the, the the my observation about your observation about being able to talk is that it might be an indication that you might be able to think, but not necessarily. Uh, so one doesn't necessarily follow the other. Uh, and that I don't think you make, I don't think you make uh, good anything, whether it's buildings or, or, or art, without starting with a good idea. Um, but I think that making and then reflecting upon what you've made is not only uh, what has characterized the evolution of human beings, but also what each of us, in a way, has to do. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you actually are making a thing or you're making a life. Uh, you do something and hopefully you reflect upon it. And I think that maybe with architecture and art, that, that uh, necessity to reflect upon what you have done also, in a way, determines also, well, the responsibility of doing that responsibly involves other people in some way. I, I think there's, uh, there is a, a characteristic which is, uh, a, I would say it for both of us, but I, I, observing Anthony, I, I think he doesn't want to necessarily dwell in ambiguity, and I think so much art dwells in ambiguity and sort of takes its energy from being, you know, you can't quite say what it's about, and I think 
Anthony's work is very explicit, and I think that's why he's able to talk about it, because he's, he, he thinks about what he's trying to do, and then those things are concrete and explicit. And I would say the same in terms of my work, that I'm not, I'm not particularly interested in ambiguity. You know, I just think you say that's what the idea is, and that's how it's realized. This one, well, yeah, completely. This yeah. And, and, and in yeah, but that's not passive. I mean, I, I don't think interpreting context and, and you know that's not passive. I think it's the idea of trying to be confirming and not necessarily fabricating and inventing and, and making narratives. I mean, I think both of us keep our narratives very close to what we think and what we believe, and you know, they're, they're very tight. I don't think, we, I don't think we, we deal in complex stories that then we illustrate. Is that fair, Is that anything? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not interested in, in illustrating anything. I, I, I'm not sure, I feel a bit uncomfortable about, you know, abandoning the notion of ambiguity or paradox. I think you have to know uh, how you want to ask the question of yourself and, and the world. But I think that, you know, that, that attempt to formulate something is very, very different uh, from the experience of then uh, living with that question. And I think it's very similar with, with, with the buildings that David makes. I think there's a there's an absolute assurance about uh, kind of construction and material, but then something else happens, and that is that is the life that 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 in a way inhabits <coughs> and dwells in that building, and it's not something that I think you know I I have a, I I don't have any control out of how people uh, interact with my work. I think. David probably um, doesn't have very much control on how people live in his buildings, and yet if they work, I think that there has to be, uh, in a way, uh, well, the possibility of ambiguity, um, the possibility of uh, shift, of charm. Of I wasn't saying that your work doesn't contain ambiguity, I'm saying, saying your, your methodology and your the way that you um, position yourself is not mm. ambiguous. I think there's a lot of artwork which is dwells in ambiguity and dwells in the fact that none of us quite know how to interpret it. Yeah, okay. That's fair enough. <laughs> uh, I had the chance to see the exhibition in Lisbon in the center of contemporary art. I think uh, it was called Domain Field. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to ask, uh, how do you see the evolution even from critical mass to domain field? In the sense that the body and its definition uh, celebrate the place or activate the space. Is there, is there a conscious uh, par paradox between the transparency of the domain field and the, um, the massivity of the critical mass in this sense, in the way that they activate the space or in the way that they celebrate the space? Yeah, uh, this is unfortunate that no, none of you will have seen, uh, uh, well, I didn't show any slides of the most recent work. The main, the main field uh, is, a, is a work that is nearly 300 um, domains, which are random matrices made out of um, stainless steel elements and they're completely transparent but each one is made not from my own body which is what I've used for most of my work but made from uh, moulds taken from nearly 300 volunteers and um, I'm glad you've seen that show it, it, it's called Mass and Empathy and it, it, it really contrasts this recent work the main field with the earlier work Critical Mass that I showed you two slides of earlier when it was installed at the um, Royal Academy there are seven hanging pieces and then uh, 40, no, 52 lying ones on the ground. 
Um, for me, the this is a bit difficult for those of you who haven't seen it. This is a, it's a rather fine um, late modernist building built in the sixties in, in Lisbon, um, and for me, I was just trying to make a in a way a, a, a dialectic between openness and transparency, which I also apply to the building. So we took all the, all the partition walls, rather like in Cologne, down. We took all the um, screens away from the windows. And the work goes from outside, um, where it's placed both in ornamental uh, ponds, in the foyer, in the garden beyond the foyer, and in a, another parkland area, and in the main space. Uh, the main exhibition space. And then two floors below that, in a completely functional part of the technical uh, side of the museum, I showed um, critical mass. And I, I guess, you know, for me, the, the idea of the installation was um, to make people ponder the relationship between, if you like, uh, everyday life and uh, oppression, or the necessary, the necessary uh, dark side to the establishment of law, and I don't. And this is a this is a very very big issue, and it's probably rather uh, a difficult um, and probably not the right time to go into it in, in great detail. But so far as I'm concerned, critical mass is is a, is a bearing witness in a way to 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 the to the twentieth century and, and the dark side of the twentieth century. I think that, that the main field is in a sense a very optimistic work. It has to do with notions of an open society and in a way an, an open space of the institution. And whether w I think the the the, the, the <coughs> exhibition questions uh, whether that's a possibility. It's a, the, the issue between the ability to, to, in a way, establish law without pain uh, and the ability to construct a society without a law uh, is, 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 is the, the big question that the, the exhibition asks. Can I, <laughs> can I just uh, thank both uh, Anthony and David. I, I feel that now with uh, these uh, last comments, uh, we, we are almost ready to have this other lecture which is about Salerno and the law courts and the <laughs> whole issue of, of uh, justice and uh, the kind of space of democracy and space of justice, which might be uh, another sort of interesting conversation about uh, how, how architecture in some way responds, going back to David's point about experience. Some of these, uh, some of these things, I've certainly enjoyed it. I'm sure that everybody else has enjoyed this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.